Okay, hi everyone. Oi, what is this stupid thing doing? Sorry, I have no idea why I just did that. One sec. Okay, hi, this is our um, lecture on excretory systems, right? So body fluid regulation and excretory systems in humans, uh, we're gonna call, you know, human urinary system, chapter 36. Okay, so just like, again, all these chapters uh, are set up the same way. We'll talk about animal excretory systems and some um, differences between uh, different species or different groups of species and then talk about the human urinary system. Make sure you have your review sheet with you taking notes as you go along. Okay, so kind of just two terms here and, and we should know the definitions of these. So osmoregulation uh, refers to balancing the level of water and salts in the body. Okay, so an excretory system is going to do that. It's going to balance levels of level water and also salts um, in the body. Our urinary system will, will do that. If you talk about the process of excretion, okay, this is the process by which metabolic wastes are removed from the body by the osmoregulatory system of an animal. And so again, if we're talking about the urinary system in human, those wastes are removed through the urine, right? Okay, now, if we're talking about these metabolic waste products, right? Um, basically, these are waste products that are formed from the breakdown of amino acids and nucleic acids, um, and they result in the formation of ammonia. And so also there's breakdown of other or other metabolic waste that's gonna be excreted in the urine as well. We're particularly gonna talk about here, um, amino acids and nucleic acids because they produce ammonia, okay? And ammonia is toxic, okay? And so has to be um, converted to urea or uric acid right away because it's very toxic and then it will be urea or the uric acid will be excreted out, okay? Um, all right. So it says high solubility permits it to be excreted directly by many aquatic animals, right? So a lot of aquatic animals can just excrete that ammonia directly, okay? But terrestrial animals actually have to convert that ammonia to urea or uric acid, again, because it's very toxic, and then excrete out these molecules, okay? All right, so urea, so a couple differences between these two molecules, urea can be excreted in, in a moderately concentrated solution, okay? Um, so that's what's produced by mammals, sharks, and adult amphibians, and it allows a certain amount of body water to be conserved, okay, because it doesn't have to be, um, um, you know, allow some body water to be conserved, but it's still some water needs to be secreted out or some water needs to be used to secrete out that urea. And you're going to see what, why I'm mentioning this in a second because we're going to compare, okay? Um, to excrete, you know, these metabolic wastes via urea, it's going to require more energy than just getting rid of the ammonia because there's a chemical reaction that's needed to convert ammonia to urea, okay? So that's what all these points are taking into account here. For uric acid, it actually requires much less water per unit nitrogen excreted, okay? So you don't have to excrete as much water um, to get rid of uric acid, okay? Um, now, there are you know, it's not just one chemical reaction to go from ammonia to uric acid. There is a complex series of enzymatic reactions. Therefore, it's going to t require more energy to produce um, uric acid than it does urea, okay? And so uric acid is produced in reptiles, birds, and insects, okay? And so um, these animals um, are not going to need as much water and can survive in drier habitats because you can secrete that uric acid um, without as much water as needed as is needed with urea. Okay, um, it says it's advantageous for shelled embryos. Um, it says nitrogenous wastes are actually stored in the shell until hatching, and then. Um, it can then be excreted, excreted out there. It says buildup in blood and precipitation around joints produces gout in humans. Um, my father actually has gout, and so it's a buildup of this uric acid um, because of sort of, I guess, a faulty sort of breakdown um, of, of ammonia or ex excretion of that, okay? Um, and for the most part, again, we're talking about, we're talking about mammals and humans, you're gonna be producing urea and not uric acid, okay? All right, so just to sort of put this in picture form, and again, you guys should understand what this figure is showing you. 
Um, again, we're talking about nitrogenous wastes, and nitrogenous wastes are formed by the breakdown of proteins and amino acids, okay? So these are wastes that contain nitrogen. Um, and basically, they form ammonia. Ammonia has to be excreted out right away, but that can only happen um, directly in aquatic animals, okay? So they just excrete out that in, in, in ammonia because it requires lots and lots of water to be able to do that. They live in the water, so that's no problem, okay? Um, however, that's not possible in terrestrial, anim terrestrial animals, okay? So for adult amphibians, sharks, mammals, they're going to convert this ammonia into urea and then excrete it out. And you can see that's sort of middle of the road here. So there's a certain amount of water that's needed, a certain amount of energy needed to produce that, right? Because there's a chemical conversion that has to occur. If you talk about uric acid, it's gonna need a lot more energy to go from ammonia to uric acid, right? A lot more energy is gonna be used, but a lot less water, okay? So those animals that live in environments where there's not as much water available, they're not secreting large amounts of urine, they don't, they don't have that ability, um, they're gonna need to convert that ammonia to uric acid and then excrete it out that way, okay? All right, now if we talk about some excretory organs amongst invertebrates first, okay, um, it says most animals have tubular excretory organs, so that's sort of a characteristic of excretory organs that they're tubular, um, and their, their function is to regulate water salt balance of the body, okay, they will excrete metabolic waste out into the environment, um, so in some different types of excretory organs that exist in different invertebrates, um, in planaria, planarians, right? Flame cells, okay? Nephridia in earthworms, malpighian tubules in insects. These are all um, organs or excretory organs that essentially their function again is to regulate water salt balance and excrete metabolic waste into the environment, okay? So these are, these are excretory organs in these different types of um, invertebrates, okay? Um, now, I mentioned urine before. Urine is a liquid that contains metabolic waste, right, and excreted salts and water, okay? Um, the earthworm will secrete a dilute urine, okay? So it gets actually passed out of the body via this excretory pore, and I'm going to show you guys a picture in a second. Insects will actively transport uric acid from the hemolymph into these malpighian tubules that will then, um, and then it will be excreted out through there. Um, <clears throat> And, and so here, um, this is then continuing on with, with the insects here, right? Because we got to, we we're talking about insects here. It says semi-solid uric acid leaves the insect's body through the anus because basically water will get reabsorbed there and then, um, and then whatever doesn't get reabsorbed will then exit out that way, okay? Um, in terms of continuing here talking about invertebrates, if we talk about aquatic crustaceans like crabs, um, nitrogenous waste will diffuse through the gills, okay? So if you've ever eaten a crab or you open it up and you see that green stuff and there's the green glands, those are the excretory organs in the head region of some crustaceans, okay? Um, shrimp, pill bugs, their excretory organs are um, in maxillary segments, they're called maxillary glands, okay? Spider scorpions and arachnoids actually use something called coxoglands, okay? So you can see there are a variety of different types of organs um, or a variety of different types of excretory organs between different invertebrates, okay? They all serve that same main function that we're talking about. So if we look at some pictures here, we talked about these flame cells, right? And so you can see here, these are the flame cells, and then there's these sort of tubules that they're connected to, okay? And so this is essentially the excretory system in planarians. Again, what is its function? It's to maintain water salt balance, right? So it's gonna take in water that it needs, take in or, or keep, you can kind of think of sort of keeping the amount of water that's necessary and then excreting out what it doesn't need. Um, and it's also gonna be able to excrete out those metabolic waves that we talked about. Um, in terms of the earthworm here, right, nephridium, and actually you'll notice once we start talking about the human urinary system and look at the nephron, you can see that this nephridium looks very similar um, in structure to the nephron, okay? You guys don't need to be able to label, no, um, you're not responsible for labeling these parts or anything from, from these diagrams, okay? These are just meant to be illustrative to show you what these different excretory organs look like, okay? All right. 
Now, we particularly have to talk about aquatic vertebrates, okay? So this was just giving you examples of different types of excretory organs in invertebrates, right? So we gave the three main examples, planaria, earthworms, and insects. Um, gave some other examples and cr crustaceans. Um, and then now we're going to talk about aquatic vertebrates, okay? Um, so it says in most vertebrates, the kidneys are the most important organs involved in osmoregulation, okay? So, and that's true. Um, in humans. So kidneys perform functions critical to homeostasis. So they have many homeostatic functions. Um, one is maintaining balance between water and salt. Okay, so ions like sodium, calcium, potassium, phosphate, right? Though these ions, though they may seem like they're not that important, are ridiculously important to the function of all of your cells, but particularly skeletal, right cells or bone cells nervous system cells and and muscular system cells so neurons and muscle cells cannot function properly if the um levels of sodium and potassium are not maintained to what they should be or maintain at homeostatic levels okay and so the kidney um or the excretory system in general is responsible for maintaining these levels at homeostatic state okay so the kidneys will produce urine right and then again in that urine you have a number of different metabolic wastes we just kind of talked about some of that there and um again the concentration of that urine will depend on um where that animal lives right as well as how much water and how much salt is taken in and we again we talked about that in the beginning when we we're talking about the differences between excreting ammonia versus urea versus uric acid okay now again it's a special case here when we're talking about vertebrates or animals that actually live in the water okay um so there's three different sort of examples here if we're talking about different types of fish right so cartilaginous fish right like sharks um have blood that's nearly isotonic to seawater now i will tell you that we got to kind of remember or go back to um, bio 111 or general bio one and think about tonicity right where we talked about an isotonic solution versus a hypertonic solution versus a hypotonic solution so if you don't quite remember that make sure you go back and review that okay so if we say something is isotonic right we're saying the cartilaginous fishes have blood that's nearly isotonic to seawater that means it's the same concentration sort of salt concentration let's just say salt in general okay um, in the blood versus the outside okay so it says blood contains enough urea to match the tonicity of seawater and so if you think about that then that means there would be no net movement in one one specific direction uh, of water okay so we're going to talk about the movement of water if we talk about marine bony fishes right so in the marine environment high salts right salt water um and so that environment, the water on the outside is hypertonic to blood plasma of bony fish, meaning there's more solute, more salt outside in the environment than there is in that bony fish's blood, okay? And so because of that, water will have the tendency to be lost, okay? Because it's going towards that hypertonic environment where there is less water. Remember, we talked about tonicity and we talked about um, it in relationship just of cells, right? If we put an animal cell in an isotonic versus a hypertonic versus a hypotonic solution, which way will water move? So this is the same idea here. We're just kind of thinking of that, about it on a bigger picture here, right? Um, just thinking about that, you know, just that, that water moving to the outside of the fish versus coming in, okay? All right, so it says it tends to promote osmotic loss of water here in the marine bony fishes. Again, they're in a saltwater environment. And so it says the gain of they gain ions by drinking water, right? So by drinking water, they're taking in more salts. All right, I'm going to show you a picture too. Freshwater bony fish sort of have the opposite issue, right? Freshwater, not saltwater, okay? It will it tends to promote the gain of water by osmosis, okay? Because um, inside the fish or the fish's blood is more um, hypertonic than the outside, okay? So the water is going to have the tendency to move in. It says there's a loss of ion as excess water is excreted, okay? Right? Because it's taking in so much water, it's going to have to keep excreting that water. All right. So 
in terms of what happens as a result of what we just talked about here, okay? Um, and so I am gonna, I am spending a lot of time on this and making sure I explain this because I think it's an important concept, okay? Um, so for marine bony fishes, right? Blood plasma is hypotonic to seawater. They passively lose water through the gills, um, but they they must constantly drink that seawater to compensate. Okay, so they're compens they're basically they keep um, drinking that water to compensate for the loss due to the basically the movement of of water just by osmosis, right? Because there's more water in the blood plasma, it's going to have the tendency to leave the fish. Okay. So they have to they have to basically drink that to compensate, okay? But when they're drinking seawater, they're going to also be taking in excess salt ions, okay? So they need to have a mechanism to basically balance that, all right? And so there's actually a active an active transport mechanism in the gills that will transport um, those excess salt ions back out into the seawater, okay? Again, these freshwater bony fish have the opposite problem, that blood plasma is hypertonic to freshwater, so they will passively gain water through the gills, and they have to basically eliminate this excess water through tons and tons of, of hypotonic urine, okay? So they're always peeing, right? They're getting rid of all, all of that excess water. All right, and so you can see this in picture form here. So marine bony fish versus a freshwater bony fish, okay? So um, again, because they have this guy's got passive loss of water through the gills, A is always going to be drinking to compensate for that. But there's lots of salt in that water, so he has to have a way of getting rid of that salt. And so there is a mechanism that gets rid of that excess salt. Okay, and he's also not going to really be um, dispensing lots of urine, right? Okay, scanty amount. Uh, again, opposite situation here. He's got tons of water coming in, okay? And then salt also be is being taken in here because he's excreting large, large, large amounts of, of water with not a lot of salt because he wants to take keep in as much salt as he can. Um, and there's no reason for him to drink because he's passively taking in this water all the time, okay? So hopefully we understand that and I can, um, you know, sort of pull this up at our next meeting and just see that everyone understands. Okay. Now, if we move on to terrestrial vertebrates, so the that was aquatic vertebrates, right? These fish. Um, now we can talk a little bit about terrestrial vertebrates, okay? Um, and then we will talk about humans. So um, terrestrial animals will lose water through excretion and respiration, okay? Obviously, you must drink water to make up for the loss, okay? Um, and so it says some reduce excretory loss by excreting nitrogen as relatively insoluble uric acid. We talked about that on the first or second slide, right? When we talked about um, reptiles and birds, okay? Um, when, when basically you're excreting those nitrogenous wastes using uric acid, you don't then need to excrete a lot of water. And therefore, then you don't have to drink as much water, okay? And you can survive in a, in a, in a hot, dry environment, all right? So... Here's an example, right? There's this kangaroo rat, okay? Has other adaptations that basically um, keep water in, okay? Because there's not a lot of water um, around in that environment, okay? So they also have highly convoluted nasal passage with a mucous membrane surface that captures any amount of condensed water in the air and keeps it there, okay? Um, and the kidney structure, is actually longer and more efficient than other animals, okay? And so if you look at this little guy, this little kangaroo rat, um, it's just pointing out some of these adaptations that allow or enable him to live in such a dry environment, okay? It says fecal pellets are dry. There's not much water coming out there because he's got to keep as much water as he can in. Um, and so, right, I talked about those those long convoluted pass air passages. Um, basically, he's keeping in as much moisture um he's keeping as much in and not exhaling it out okay and so that's happening in these this longer nasal passage before he exhales it out um the fur will also prevent evaporated loss of water at the skin again all these adaptations help him uh, survive in this dry environment okay all right now a little bit more, right? Some more examples and sort of um, adaptations that allow certain animals to survive in sort of different environments, right? So marine mammals, 
um, and seabirds, okay? So it says due to their evolution on land, their kidneys are good at conserving water. Um, and so whatever, some of these have been adapted to living in or near the sea, right? Because we're talking about marine mammals and seabirds. And so some of these animals have specialized salt glands that will actively transport salt from the blood to the external environment, okay? Um, so in seabirds, they have these salt excreting glands near their eyes. So it almost looks like they're a little, they're crying here, but um, the salt is running out there on purpose because again, because they live in this marine environment where there's lots of salt around, they need to have a mechanism to excrete it out, much like we saw with the marine bony fish, okay? Um, so sea turtles, that salt gland is a modified tear gland, okay? It's the same idea, it's just a different type of gland that's gonna excrete or actively um, uh, excrete out the salt, okay? And it says these glands are regulated by the nervous system, much like um, every gland uh, is regulated by the nervous system, okay? So basically there's gonna be, if we say it's regulated by the nervous system, um, if we talk about homeostasis, right, there's going to be something that's going to detect that change in homeostasis that the salt levels are too high and then activate this gland to release the salt. OK. All right. And so there's an example um, here. OK. All right. And so then that brings us to talk about the human urinary system. So, again, I think this is the one chapter that there's quite a lot of information um, relating to. Um, other types of animals, okay? And so make sure you really pay attention to that, especially understanding um, the marine fish versus the freshwater fish and, and um, how they've adapted to those environments to be able to maintain appropriate water and salt levels within their body, okay? All right. So again, we're going to now talk about the human urinary system. What is the function of the human urinary system? Same main function to balance, right, or maintain appropriate water and salt levels, okay? So the main organ responsible for that, or the main organ in the human urinary system, are, or main organs, are the kidneys, okay? And so um, they're located, right, sort of in your lower back, okay? You know, you can get, give your friend or your brother a kidney shot, right, right in that space there, and so they're really right next to the vertebral column, okay? Each kidney is then connected to your ureter, and then those ureters um, basically bring the urine that's formed in the kidneys to the bladder, and then there's a urethra that then sends that, that urine out of the body, okay? So in terms of anatomy, the urinary system is pretty simple um, in terms of gross anatomy, okay? So there it is, and, and we should be able to identify, you know, from a diagram, the kidneys, the ureters and the urinary bladder and then the urethra, okay? So we should know that kidneys, ureter, right? Coming from each kidney, going to the bladder and then the urethra passes that urine to the outside. All right, okay. So if you look at the kidney or you take, if you, you know, again, if we were in lab and, and, and we were able to do some dissections, you know, we could take a kidney, we can cross section through, um, we can look at these sort of three major parts, but really what we're gonna focus on is really the microscopic um, anatomy of the kidney and what's happening at that level, okay? But the three major parts of the kidney is renal cortex, which is the outer re region, okay? The renal medulla, and then the renal pelvis. So this is more towards the center, and then this is the innermost part here okay so again if you kind of cut through it's more like it's not a cross section it's a frontal section i guess through the kidney you can see here again this is the renal cortex right the medulla and the pelvis and so then if you see this is now kind of like a little pie, slice of pie here zooming in right and so you can see in the cortex right you can see these nephrons okay um, and then some of the tubules will they will then extend into the medulla as well but then sort of um, you can see that the renal pelvis is basically leading to the ureter, okay? All right, so like I said, you're gonna focus mo mostly when you talk about function of the kidney on the nephron, okay? So each kidney is composed of over 1 million nephrons, okay? And again, these are tubular structures as well, just like we talked about, you know, the planaria and the earthworm in terms of their excretory structures being tubular, same thing here, okay? 
So we should know the parts of the nephron. So each nephron is made up of several parts. So um, the glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule, okay, the glomerulus, the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of nephron or the loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. Okay, and again, remember, there's over a million of these in each kidney. Okay, these are the functional units of the kidney. Okay, when we talk about the kidney, basically, you know, maintaining water salt balance and producing urine, it's happening in these nephrons. Okay, all right, so if we look at the the sort of anatomy of the nephron, okay? This, I, I, I like this diagram here. So you can see renal artery, right? So when, so this is bringing blood, um, you know, into the nephron, okay? And so again, you know, the, the kidney is gonna essentially, um, you know, filter that blood and remove those nitrogenous wastes, right? And also, it's going to be responsible for maintaining that water salt balance. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that function as we go along. But so anyway, blood's coming in. Okay. The glomerulus is sort of that filter part. That filtration is going to occur here. Okay. So blood goes into here and it's going to come out as sort of this, this filtrate. Okay. So it's not blood anymore once it passes through this glomerulus. Um, and actually, I think I have another diagram that I talk more about the function. So let's just kind of look at the anatomy here and then... Um, I'll reiterate the function again, okay? So then this goes to the proximal tubule, okay? And if you follow this along, right, um, you could see here, this is the loop of Henle or the loop of the nephron and then distal convoluted tubule and then collecting duct, okay? And so like I said, there are certain function for each of these parts of the nephron that we'll talk about in a second. All right, so if you wanna look at some, you know, um, microscopic anatomy here, uh, you can you can see this. Here, so this is actually showing you um, a surface view of the glomerulus, and you can actually see the blood vessels going in. Okay, um, and again, this is this is showing you the glomerular capsule, right, and the glomerulus. All right. Okay, so like I said, let's talk more about function. And so, by the way, I'm not going to show you micros, you know, pictures under the microscope and ask you to label parts, okay, in case you were wondering. Um, but again, this is now showing you if you took a cross section through that loop, right, you can see these different um, ducts, right? It's tubular, okay? Same thing here. You see the glomerular capsule, and then you can also see cross sections through these ducts, okay, these tubules. All right. Um, okay, so in terms of function, right? So three distinct processes that are happening at the nephron, all right? So I kind of started off mentioning them, but then I said I would discuss them further here. So glomerular filtration is going to happen at in the glomerulus, okay? And so I told I showed you that that blood was coming in, and basically there's pressure in there, it and, and it sort of pushes small molecules um, through right, the glomerulus to the inside of that glomerular capsule. And basically, again, what's coming out on the other side is filtrate, okay? So it says it's the same as the composition of plasma, except there are no proteins there. So if there is protein in your urine, it indicates that there's some issue going on. It's, it's also, it's one, it's a hallmark of diabetes, but it could also indicate some, some issue in the kidney, okay? So protein should not be getting through. Um, if you have a high, high amount of proteins in the blood, then potentially some of them do get through, okay? Hence where the sort of, why you see that in diabetes. But again, if there's protein in the urine, right, it indicates that there may be some issue with the glomerulus here and the filtration part of it, okay? All right, so that's the first part. The next one is tubular reabsorption at those convoluted tubules, okay? So when we say reabsorption, we're talking about stuff that's in the filtrate, is now gonna be reabsorbed back into the blood because the body still needs it, okay? So for instance, sodium ions, and again, this is all about homeostasis. So there's a certain level of sodium ions that needs to be maintained. If that level is lower, then there will be more sodium ions reabsorbed and put back into the bloodstream, okay? So same thing, chloride ions, water, right, will be reabsorbed as well. Um, nutrients, they'll be selectively reabsor reabsorbed. Again, um, if, if they're needed, then those nutrients will be reabsorbed. If they are not needed, they will stay in that filtrate and ultimately be excreted out in the urine, okay? 
All right, so that's tubular reabsorption. Now, tubular secretion will sort of kind of follows, you know, a little bit further along these tubules. Um, molecules like hydrogen ions and penicillin are actively secreted into the convoluted tubules, meaning secreted, meaning they're coming from the blood because there's lots of capillaries and, and a, a huge sort of network of blood vessels there. They'll move into those convoluted tubules and into the filtrate. Why? Because the body needs to excrete them out. Okay. So anything that, that was not filtered out by the glomerulus um, has a, still has a chance of basically being um, um, added to the filtrate here to be excreted out in the urine. Okay. So there are other types of drugs and stuff that get metabolized that are then water soluble that will enter into the filtrate this way as well. Okay. So again, if we're talking about reabsorption, these are things that the body wants to take back in. It goes back into the bloodstream for secretion. These are things that we, that the body wants to move into that filtrate into those convoluted tubules so that they will then be excreted out. Okay. So don't be confused by terminology here by reabsorption and secretion or excretion, right? We got to keep these terms straight. All right, so like I said, you got to you see the same picture again, except now it's pointing out the function, right? Functions that we just talked about and where that's happening. Okay, so again, filtration at the glomerulus, right? Um, it's it's keeping right proteins are are going to stay out, but water, urea, glucose, amino acids, right? Salts, they're all getting through here. Okay, um, and then once we we talk about this tubular reabsorption here. Um, right, that's the sort of green that's going on, meaning that things are moving out of the tubules and going where? Into the blood vessels, right? Nutrients, salt molecules, right, need to be reabsorbed because the body, the body still needs them, okay? We talk about secretion. Um, again, this is the blue arrows here, meaning these are things that are coming out of the blood and going into the filtrate here, into the tubules, okay? These are things that the body wants to get rid of, all right? Okay, so again, we've sort of been, I've sort of been mentioning this um, as we move through in terms of homeostasis, right? Maintaining homeostatic levels of water and salts, but the kidneys are also um, important in maintaining levels of other things as well. We've already talked about the excretion of metabolic waste, right? Um, excreting that urea and maintaining that um, type of homeostasis. Also water salt, we talked about, a lot about, but also, they're involved in maintaining acid base balance, right? pH balance. So if you think about um, pH, you know, more hydrogen ions will decrease the pH, right? And we talked about secreting um, hydrogen ions here. So the kidneys are heavily involved in maintaining acid base balance, which is super, super important to proper function um, of your organs, right? Also involved in um, maintaining um, or, or secretion of hormones. So, so sorry. So it's kind of giving you homeostatic function. So maintenance of these sort of water salt balance, acid base balance, also involved in excreting metabolic waste. If it's not efficiently, efficiently excreting metabolic waste, they would then build up and that would then throw off homeostasis. The kidneys also secrete hormones. So um, a particular hormone called erythropoietin, which stimulates red blood cell production. Okay, so again, if, if you don't, you know, if this wasn't functioning properly, you wouldn't have enough red blood cells. Okay, so again, we can think about homeostasis. Um, and so um, if you, erythropoietin, right, was actually, it's something that, that uh, endurance athletes um, might take to stimulate red blood cell production, which then will enhance the oxygen carrying capacity of your body and thus make you better at endurance sports like cycling, okay? There are also other types of supplements you can take that, that will actually stimulate the production of erythropoietin, but you can actually take that itself as well, okay? Well, you're not, you can't because it's banned, but. <laughs> All right, so if we sort of continue on a little bit more about this, so, um, so it says here, excretion of hypertonic urine, right? So if we talk a little bit more about excreting urine in this process in general, it says it's dependent upon reabsorption of water from the loop of the nephron and the collecting duct, right? So meaning that's where water is going to be reabsorbed from. If there's not a lot of water that's reabsorbed, then there would be less water, um, then there'll be more water in the urine, okay? Um, 
So it says here, an osmotic gradient within the renal medulla causes water to leave the de descending limb along its entire length. Don't worry about this mechanism here. Um, the, the bottom line is um, if, right, if water stays in here in the tubules, a lot of water will be excreted out. If a lot of water gets reabsorbed because of the needs of the body, you would have less water being excreted out. So if you think about being dehydrated, right, one way you can tell is that your urine is very concentrated. It looks even just by looks of it. OK, or you're just not excreting a lot. Well, that's because any water that was in this filtrate, right, needed to be reabsorbed because your body needs it. And therefore, you're not excreting enough. You're not excreting a lot out. OK. All right. Um, now, there are hormones that control this as well. OK, so that's sort of why what we're getting at here. So there's a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. OK, and so we may have heard of the term diuretic before, which what a diuretic does and you can, you know, people take diuretics for various reasons to treat hypertension, to treat edema. Right. Which is um, accumulation of fluid kind of in various different parts of the body. Um, anyway, what diuretics do is they they increase the amount of water that's being excreted out. Right. So they they increase the secretion of water, essentially. So. Um, there's gonna be a lot more water in here. You're basically want the water or you're increasing the water leaving the blood and going into here. Now, if you talk about antidiuretic, it's the opposite, okay? So antidiuretic hormone will promote the reabsorption of water in the collecting duct, meaning it's gonna cause more water to go, right? The green hours to go back into the blood, less water in the urine, okay? So a diuretic, causes you to produce more urine, you're excreting out more urine. An antidiuretic hormone does the opposite. You're keeping more water in, okay? And um, so, like I said, th this hormone controls this whole process to make sure, right, that the right amount of water is being reabsorbed, okay? Um, and so I, I just basically told you diuretic or diuresis um, or antidiuresis, what it means, okay? Um, okay, so don't worry about the aquaporins and, and what have you, but I want you to know what antidiuretic hormone does, um, and what, you know, and what also what a diuretic does, which is the opposite. So antidiuretic hormone promotes the reabsorption of water in the collecting duct. Okay. Meaning it's reabsorption. Again, when we're talking about reabsorption, we mean it's going back into the blood your body is keeping it in. It does not want to excrete it out in the urine, okay? A diuretic does the opposite. Okay, um, this, this diagram, I'm not, you don't have to worry too much about. I mean, again, it's kind of showing the same things, but it was, it's particularly sort of showing you um, where, um, well, one, it's focusing on salts, right, ions and water, and where they're being reabsorbed or where they're leaving the tubules, okay? Um, you don't need to worry about exactly this here, but it's just showing you sort of the points at which this is happening, okay? Um, all right, so I'll sort of leave it at that. You you can just ignore this if you want. All right, um, now there are also other hormones that um, help control the urinary system, okay? Um, and again, so for this, especially, you know, you guys don't, I'm not going to ask you too much about this, but again, I feel like these are worth mentioning just for, for you guys to appreciate how complex, um, these systems are. Um, so there is a system called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Okay. And so this is when, again, this is when homeostasis is thrown off, right? There's a low blood volume. Right, so the body detects that there's a low blood volume. Well, what would it want to do, right? It would basically want to reabsorb um, sodium ions and then reabsorb water to basically increase that blood volume. And so that, that sort of um, pathway or the, the, the low blood volume, right? will stimulate the kidneys to basically activate this system, okay? So renin will be secreted and then 
it changes to angiotensinogen and then angiotensin 1 and then it gets converted to angiotensin 2. These are all hormones, okay? Um, and then eventually adrenal glands will release aldosterone and then aldosterone will have this sort of effect here, okay? So this is a mechanism that's um, activated when the body detects that there's low blood volume, okay? Um, and so you would have, when you have low blood volume, it would have low blood pressure. I mean, and this could be due to the fact that you have a ginormous laceration somewhere, right? And you're losing blood. Um, and so no matter what happens with this, it's never going to be able to compensate for that. But there are other reasons why their blood volume might dip down. I mean, and things like this are always happening, right? Remember when you think about homeostasis or homeostasis of anything, there's always push pull right? There's always different types of hormones that are being released to maintain that homeostasis. Um, this is another hormone here. So ANH or atrial natriuretic hormone. Okay. Um, and this, again, now this is sort of the opposite. So if there's a detection of increased blood volume, this will inhibit the secretion of renin and aldosterone. So it'll have the opposite effect. Okay. So, so again, you can kind of, if you think about in terms of homeostasis here, we're talking about blood volume, okay? So that's something that has to be maintained at appropriate level. If blood volume is low, it, it activates the system here. If blood volume is increased and detected, um, basically there's the receptors that are in these cardiac cells, and then that triggers the release of this hormone, this will then lead to a decrease in blood volume, okay? So it promotes excretion of sodium and water. All right. Um, and so this is this is basically kind of just showing you some of these things that I just mentioned, this renin angiotensin aldosterone system. OK, again, you guys, I, I'm not expecting you guys to know all the details of this pathway. Um, I guess potentially maybe we should know that, you know, if I ask you what would happen if there was if the body detected low blood volume, it would be this system that was activated. What would happen if there was an increase in blood volume or what's the result or what's the effect of atrial natriuretic hormone, right? It's to decrease blood volume and blood pressure, okay? You don't need to know any of these steps or anything like that. All right, so this is kind of just showing you where the angiotensinogen is coming from, right? That the kidneys are the ones that secrete the renin. Um, and just showing you that pathway. We don't need to know these details here, okay? Um, I, I mentioned before about the different or the four main homeostatic mechanisms of the urinary system, and one of them was acid-base balance, okay? Um, I said that, you know, obviously the function of cells is, is influenced by pH, and it needs to be maintained at appropriate levels. And so um, there is a... Um, let me see here. Yeah, all right, all right. We, we, can, we can go a little bit into this. So it says pH is regulated by the bar bicarbonate buffer system. So pH can be adjusted by the reabsorption of bicarbonate ions or the secretion of hydrogen ions. I mentioned this a few slides ago, right? So if there's too many hydrogen ions that are kept inside the body or inside the blood, it's going to drop that pH, right? And so it's important that the urinary system secretes out the appropriate amount of, of hydrogen ions, okay? Um, also, though, the, you know, at the nephron, basically, you can reabsorb bicarbonate, which will then raise the pH, okay? Um, also, if you think about, you know, levels of carbon dioxide, okay, those greatly affect bicarbonate levels in the blood, okay? So if there's too much carbon dioxide or you're not getting rid of enough carbon dioxide, right, because of some issue with breathing or your hypervalent, um, um, right, something something like that where you're not exhaling out fully and you're not getting rid of that carbon dioxide, it is going to affect those bicarbonate levels and actually bring the pH down, okay? So there's uh, there's reasons, I guess that's just giving you an example of, um, of something that would change the pH, right? And therefore, then the kidney would need to adjust to compensate for that change in pH, okay? And so that's what this is just showing you here. The kidney tubule, um, you know, basically, you know, you can pull hydrogen ions out of, of the blood, right? If that pH is too low and excrete them out. Um, but also you can, from the kidney tubule, if, if that, again, that pH is too low, 
um, you can basically transport in or 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 bring in reabsorb these um, bicarbonate ions, right? Okay, so that's what just showing you. So again, if you think about pH, it has to do with the um, concentration of hydrogen ions, right? And the concentration of ions like this that are that are essentially if you have more of these more basic, right, higher pH. If you have more hydrogen ions in a given solution like blood, it's gonna decrease that pH, okay? And it'll be more acidic. Important that blood is maintained at a pH of about 7.4. Any deviation either way is going to be a severe problem, okay? All right, and so that ends our lecture on, the, on excretory systems.